Hey guys, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So what I want to do in this video is finish up the introduction to the topic of um, ethnicity in ancient Rome and from there start moving on to specific examples like the Egyptians, the Christians, uh, you know, Greeks, Gauls, etc. So to start us off in this video, I figured this passage by Seneca describing the city of Rome around the middle of the first century roughly, fits pretty well. He says the following, Look at this crush of people for whom the housing of this immense city scarcely suffices. Most of them are far from their place of birth. They have come together from their towns and cities, in fact, from the whole world. Some ambition drew, others the necessity of a public job or of a diplomatic task, still others the pull of extravagance as they search out a place ready and ripe for depravity. Some the desire of higher education brings, others the public spectacles, some men a friendship is drawn, and some the work in Rome that offers plenty of opportunities to show their worth. Some arrivals have brought their body to sell, some their eloquence. All types of men have rushed to the city that values high virtues and vices alike. Then go from this megalopolis, which can be called shared, so to speak, to the cities all around. Most of these also have some foreign population. So the point I'm trying to raise with, you know, reading that to you is that there really was a fairly high degree um, of freedom of movement among the Roman population. Not everybody, of course, uh, but it's been estimated that by the late empire, so by the... 300s broadly and you know a, a bit earlier in the late 200s in the early 400s the percent of the population that moved around is something like 40 percent so it's fairly substantial now the roman empire was supported through an imperially run infrastructure and this includes ports wharves um you know chartered ships roads etc now there were of course independently run merchant ships and merchant fleets we know those existed but it wouldn't have been unusual for a smaller merchant who maybe can't afford his own ship to have been able to work his way onto an imperial shipping route, maybe taking up some cargo space and in that way travel across the Roman Empire. People utilized road systems in a similar manner, so, you know, people moved everywhere. And when the Colosseum was constructed, for example, this was one of those things in the Roman world that you had to go see, and we have records telling us that that amphitheater attracted people as far away as Thrace, Egypt, Northern Europe, Ethiopia, and in the lands of the Sarmatians, so what is basically today like Ukraine and like southern Russia, like that area. So those sorts of records exist, but we also have other sources, epigraphy, which give a slightly different impression about the city of Rome and the people who lived there and who visited it and why. So there's something like 2,000 inscriptions, roughly, in the city itself. And these inscriptions break people into three different groups. There are the Romans and the non-Romans, so the Peregrini, who we went over in the previous videos. Um, and then there are the Hospice, the foreigners. And the Peregrini and the Hospice are usually said to have come from such and such a town in such and such a province, and usually uh, with some ethnic tag or, you know, some ethnic label, like Gaul or Greek or German. Now, ancient cities were, in a word, filthy and beyond disgusting, and from the epigraphy it's been estimated, and keep in mind that these are just, you know, estimates Something like 35% of Rome's population were free men, citizens. About 30% were women, um, and the remaining 30-35% were unfree people. And then there's a certain percentage of people that don't really fit into any broad category. Um, so, my point is that this was a disgusting city. Rome was pretty nasty. Now, now, there were, of course, the famous bathhouses, aqueducts, sewer systems like the uh, Cloaca Maxima, but there were still bad neighborhoods. There were places where those hygienic centers didn't reach, and there weren't always street cleaners available. So we have reports, like the epigraphy, from antiquity of people dying and, you know, bodies just being left in the street. So people died a lot, and that population needed to be replaced quite often, so people moved. It drew people in from the provinces, which really makes Rome the heart of a multicultural empire in more than one sense of the term. So there were, of course, you know, some groups who stood out, um, and thus those 
who stood out attracted special attention in the sources. We have soldiers, for example. These guys stand out. Um, something like 11,000 to 30,000 troops were originally recruited in the provinces and were stationed in and around the city. Now, I realize, of course, that's a huge fluctuation in the numbers, right? 11 to 30,000. But you have to keep in mind that for the first 200, first 250 years or so um, of the Roman Empire, that's what historians have been able to estimate. It's a fairly long period of time, so the numbers are going to fluctuate. Now, the Praetorian Guard were their own thing. During the first two centuries, the Guard, at about 8,000, 9,000 strong, were primarily recruited in Italy itself. But during the third century, those recruiting grounds, they shift to uh, the Danubian and the eastern provinces, what is today basically like the Balkans. And there would have been contact with groups there who had their own stereotypes. And they weren't the only ones in the city. The Praetorians had a reputation for being... Um, you know, not the most loyal of guard units. So the emperors, especially the emperors of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, turned to other groups for protection. And one of the most famous ones were the Imperial German bodyguard drawn from non-Romans living north of the rhine danube frontier, in part because of the stereotype that these were large, tough people who were believed to be loyal. Now, around the second century, this guard unit is disbanded by the Emperor Galba because they were loyal to Nero, who... Galba had succeeded, and they were replaced by the um, Equite Singulari Augusti, the Imperial Cavalry, similarly drawn from other northern barbarians. Now, although military units like these would not necessarily have been present in other cities, the three biggest cities of the Principate period, so Alexandria, Antioch, uh, and Carthage, once it's rebuilt after the Punic Wars, had their own inflows and outflows of migration, as did smaller cities in the Roman Empire. So there were plenty of reasons to move around. Jobs, university educations, uh, religious cults, etc. Merchant shipping, certainly. Military posts. So eventually, although it might not have been, you know, incredibly common, it would not have been odd or, or weird to have people living in southern Gaul who were originally from, like, Roman Syria, or to have people living in northern Italy who came from, you know, the Channel Coast of Britain. Now, the Roman Empire was a massive bureaucratic machine which sucked up talent from the provinces like a dry towel sucks up water, and the interconnectedness of the state eventually led to the revitalization of the empire's ruling elite. So Trajan was the first emperor to come from outside of Italy, coming from the town of uh, Italica, near modern-day Seville in Spain. And others like Hadrian and Septimius Severus, and there's many others, followed in his footsteps. Now, between 69 and about 195, 200, the percentage of senators and other major political figures who engaged in Roman politics, who came from outside of Italy, who came from the provinces, goes from about 17%, so fairly low, to 57%. Over half of the rulers of the Roman Empire then don't come from Italy, as you might expect a very large empire would eventually, you know, do its governing. If you have multiple provinces, you need people from those areas. However, although these people came from a background that may have been multicultural, when they attained the rank and power that being a senator or an aristocrat in Roman society afforded them, it largely seemed that they culturally homogenized and stopped really identifying with their local provinces and started identifying and began to think of themselves as traditional Roman-Italian elites. Now, we know the most about these people and significantly less about the common people, um, and especially about those Roman society viewed as subhuman or not worthy of any real kind of attention, like women, children, slaves, because... These upper-class people tended to do a lot of the writing. So it's been estimated that something like the total population of the Roman Empire that were slaves was about 10%. So you take 60 million um, as the commonly given figure for the peak of the Roman population, around 200-ish, and then 10% of that would be 6 million people enslaved. So many of these people left little or no trace of their existence. We have some stuff, um, like I can recall one source the name of which I can't actually remember, um, which talks about a four-year-old slave whose job was to work in Spanish mines, but 
by and large, we have almost nothing. Now, that being said, uh, we can still broadly classify slaves into two kinds, okay? Domestic slaves and everybody else. In both cases, slavery was brutal, but among domestic slaves, there were some exceptions. You could be a grammaticus, responsible in part uh, for the education of your master's young children. You could be a house servant. Of course, if you were an attractive woman, um, then there were likely certain non-negotiable aspects of the job. Like I said, this was a brutal existence. And if you were proven loyal enough to your master and to your master's family, you could possibly have been granted manumission. Now, if that happened, well, there are some sources which tell us that families entrusted freed slaves with aspects of the family business or wealth management, things like that. And because the slave was freed and had the ability to now form their own families, the two families, freeborn and freed slave, often formed power blocks of their own. However, for the non-domestic slaves, this was an absolutely horrific existence, and they were often seen as little more than talking tools. Upon being enslaved, you lost your name, you lost your family, you lost basically every facet of your identity. And, like slaves, the landless poor of the Roman Empire are estimated to have made up something like 35% of the total population. Um, you know, obviously that percentage gets tweaked depending on the century you're looking at but little trace of them also survives. And what traces do survive often come in the form of, uh, you know, epigraphy, some kind of um, epitaph, but often these just reflect people who had a modest level of wealth because they could afford to have the memorial carved. So there is one really good example of this. It's located in Pompeii, and the tomb was created in the 60s, but the epitaph tells us that the people buried inside were two freed persons who basically started out as lower-income people, but worked their way up to a comfortable position. Um, and, you know, it's largely only these people, although not entirely, who were able to afford to do this stuff. So it's just one example of how limited our sources really are. Now, this is where we start getting back into problems with Roman ethnicity and concepts of, uh, you know, broader identity. So, so just focusing on the city of Rome as an example, the majority of the names inscribed on these, you know, roughly 2,000 um, extant inscriptions in the city are either in Latin or in Greek, which would make sense because Rome is in Italy. Um, and the Roman upper classes admired the Greek language, oftentimes they spoke it, but we aren't really able to determine, for example, if a person had a Greek name, you know, if that person really was from Greece, or if they had a name like, you know, Irene, which is Greek for peace, it's possible that they were actually Greek, but it's also possible that they were a slave, um, who was given that name, it's possible they were a Christian from Iberia who was named Irene, because of the Christian connotations of the word, it's possible that, you know, both things applied. You were a slave from Iberia, and you were given the Greek name. So like I said a moment ago, oftentimes slaves had all of their former identity obliterated, including original names, so it's difficult to track this kind of stuff. Now, going along with that, okay, we don't know for certain if the slave's original ethnic identity was kept by the slave. It's entirely possible the slave's master did not allow them to keep their original ethnic identity and impose something new on them. So if they were originally from, I don't know, Egypt, and they would be ethnically Egyptian, right? Um, maybe they're given the name Gallus, meaning Gaul, and maybe that becomes their identity. We just don't know. We don't have the evidence. From the evidence we do have, though, again, this is from many um, epitaphs and tombstones, so it's difficult to really judge how widespread this was. It looks like freed slaves are mainly the ones represented here, at least in Italy, um, and, you know, and in some of the provinces. And here they often have three names. So the use of the uh, tria nomina, the praenomen, the family name, and a specialized name. So Gaius Julius Caesar is an example of this. This is a Roman marker, a marker of Roman identity. And the fact that most of these epitaphs have this suggests either that the former identity of the slave um, was obliterated and the slaves adopted a quote-unquote Roman identity, or that they were originally Roman. Now, even if the epitaphs don't bear this, the artwork can point to different markers of identity. 
if there is a depiction of the individual in question, they could have any marker of Roman identity. A toga, carrying a scroll, meaning discharge or uh, manumission papers, hairstyles modeled on the imperial family. So these art styles and these pieces of, you know, symbolism in the overall artwork, they don't necessarily mean that person was actually Roman. It could just be that they wanted to be seen as Roman. So these are some of the problems we need to keep in mind as we investigate ideas of Roman identity. Now what we'll do in the next video is start exploring the Roman Empire, and we're going to start in what, to the Romans, was the most fantastical of their provinces, Egypt. So that's it for now, everyone. Thank you for watching, take care, and hope you're all looking forward to the next video.